previously on Energy Quest. I assisted the managing director uh, at the time, uh, reviewing business performance, representing him at uh, meetings, industry meetings and all that. We had about 48 oil marketing companies that have gone underwater. Either they owe the GRE or wow. other regulatory bodies, um, for which reason they are not able to operate. Yeah. Their licenses have been not revoked, but I mean, have been frozen. They cannot access the ERDMS system. Yeah. Uh, and how they're able to do it, I'm not sure. No, but some say that the rice seller, the sugar seller, brings in products, sells it on the market, competes with his neighbor, and they survive. So why is the oil industry having a, having a hard time? But to the, on to, to the extent own. that we are witnessing, yeah. uh, leaves a lot of questions. Okay, um, I'm interested in export. Mm -hmm. The industry has been an exportation of refined products to the landlord countries. Has it been beneficial to us? Because there were some issues before. How, 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 how is that? Petroleum product export is fraud. Why do you say so? Ask yourself, all these landlord countries we see around, mm -hmm. what, is their, what is their demand? I mean, if you take Burkina Faso, for example, I know they run this tender system whereby on a monthly basis, somebody wins a tender and, and it's supposed to bring in some products. It, yeah. You don't have people buying on spot basis. From you there. know, for the kind of volume that we see on a monthly basis that we see went through exports. All the products that are supposed to have been exported yeah. still end up here. What and of the other landlord countries? Do they have the same formula? I mean, you're looking at, I think if you look Mali. at the statistics, it's, it's Burkina, Mali, and all that. But yeah. even some of those countries, they prefer to take their products through Cote d'Ivoire. Okay. Or maybe in Lomi in some instances, but, but than taking it from Ghana. But if our price is better, they should take it from Ghana. Well, I mean, but again, they run this tender system, you know, so it is not as if that people just wake up they come to Ghana to come and buy products and buy to export. And, mm, so let's no. look at the volume of export on mm -hmm. a monthly basis and ask yourself is if indeed these products are going into the landlord countries. And remember Ghana is not the only country they, they where they source products, products from. from. They are taking it from two or three countries. Recently I heard that even in Niger there's a new refinery there because they discovered oil. Okay. So it is coming through Niger. Yeah. And if Ghana is claiming to be the sole here. export, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it, it, leaves, it leaves a lot it, it of... It doesn't add up, No, right. not at all. So, in my candid opinion, the export, the export thing is being used to, to evade taxes. Yes, okay. there has been, uh, the MP in recent times has imposed uh, some taxes on export products or oh, has really? made some of these uh, export companies to post a bond. Mm -hmm. So once you're able to prove that products have been exported out of the country, then you come back. Then you come back. It. But <laughs> look, um, this is a human institution, and anything, mm -hmm. anything is possible. I'll give you an example. In April, between April and May, if you compare the national consumption of petroleum products, from April to May, there was a decline of 23 percent. Okay. So the question is, did we? Did people stop driving cars? The industry shut down. <laughs> what accounted for this 23%? Okay. And for me, I mean, without even probing, I can trace it to the Borga depot that has been designated as the uh, the export the uh, depot or whatever. For exports, yeah. I, I'm th I, look, without without, I can say, without uh, <laughs> any fear of contradiction, that yeah. products marked as export are still finding. Uh, themselves so it's on the just market. a waiting taxes, that's all. That is all. That is all. That is all. And we need to look at that. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. when these people evade taxes, the government suffers, the MPA suffers. Remember, the MPA has an internally, I mean, the internally generated funds mm -hmm. come from the volume of products lifted from these depots. Okay. And if people are evading taxes, how are they going to get them? The boss margin is also in there. So how is the boss going to get their income to run their operations? Wow. <laughs> this tells us that the new board at NPA, the new leadership, they, they, ha they have a lot to do. They have a lot to do they and really I am happy that uh, my meeting with the, uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Mustafa Hamid, uh, listening to him, I, I, I had a sense of comfort that he's, he's going to make things right. Uh, we have already presented a list of issues that need to be, that that need to be dealt with by mm -hmm. the NPA. Okay. 
The NPA today has, uh, if you ask me, in the sub-region, is the most sophisticated authority that we have. Okay. Uh, in terms of digitization, information technology. Oh, in the sub-region, wow. I, I'll, I'll give it to them. I mean, remember we have this bulk road vehicle tracking. Mm -hmm. So every product that is lifted from all the depots tracked all are tracked the all the way to the delivery point. Mm -hmm. So they have enough data to analyze and they've, see they've, they've what is happening. They've put in so much, so I don't know why they are still We have recently, issues. they have deployed automatic tank gauges to all the service stations. I'm sure by the end of the year, they would have installed every service station with automatic tank gauges. So every liter of product that is discharged into underground tanks, they're able to see them. Mm -hmm. So now it is up to them to make use of Monetize this data. And then do the analysis and, and see where there are some outliers mm -hmm. and start to deal with. Okay. Um, tell us about the tax regime here. Well, it's, interestingly, the downstream sector contributes almost 8.5 billion cities to government revenue on an annual basis. Okay. That is if all products coming into the country are coming, are coming through tax, the, the formal channels. Now, that, that, that's a lot. It is a lot. Uh, today, at the, at the export price of 6.2, thereabouts, the tax and levies, and, and levies in there is about 1 CD 88 pesos. Uh, that's nearly 30% of the price that you pay at the pump. A little over, yeah. A little over that. Yeah. So, it's, it's very important that we, 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 we protect. Um, this source of revenue to the government. Mm -hmm. You know, OMCs are supposed to collect these taxes on behalf of the government, and in every 20, every 21 days, they have to pay these revenues mm -hmm. to the Ghana Revenue Authority. Yeah. Uh, we have been doing that very well. I mean, unless the GRA comes to say, of course, I've already mentioned that some oil marketing companies are owing on this. Yeah. And uh, this is something that they need to nip in the bud uh, before it escalates. You know, so we, as all marketing companies, we have that role to play. We are a collection agency for the government, and uh, for all intents and purposes, we need to honor that obligation yeah. to the government. Yeah, and the percentage of taxes being paid per liter, is that not so much? Is that normal around the world? Can the government no, do something about it? No, I mean, if you look it? at next door, if you look at Nigeria, yeah. Nigeria, there's zero taxes on petroleum products. That is why... Zero. Uh, it's zero, as far I mean. <laughs> It, it is zero. They don't pay any taxes on petroleum products. So prices in that country is relatively Better. cheaper than here. If you look at the U.S., the price of, uh, I mean, the, a, a gallon of, of, petro of PMS is maybe a dollar cheaper. You know, you, you know that the effect of um, petroleum prices mm -hmm. on inflation, on, on everything, it's so direct. I think it's something government should look at. Definitely, and, and I agree with you. That is why I had issues when recently the Ministry of Finance decided to increase the taxes on petroleum products. In my candid opinion, we are not efficient at collecting the taxes that we yeah, already imposed. Already existed, yeah. So why do we have to increase it for the, the, the tax uh, payer, payer to, to suffer? We don't have to, to overburden them. Look, we've been paying this uh, in 2000. There was the introduction of tall debt recovery levy because yeah. the refinery, yeah, as you I, know, I, I has I had issues that. over mm -hmm. time. And well, I have been advocating that it needs to be privatized because mm -hmm. otherwise, what is the government doing with the refinery? Mm -hmm. Over time, this tall debt recovery levy has metamorphosed into what you call the energy debt sector uh, levy or so. Mm -hmm. And this is a burden on the taxpayer. Why should we continue to pay for somebody's inefficiency? Yeah. So first, my point is, we are not efficient at collecting the taxes because there's a lot of tax evasion, either directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. Directly is whereby some OMCs or players do not pay these taxes to the government. Yeah. And indirectly is where we have products coming into the system without going through the official channels. Mm -hmm. We've heard about instances where vessels dock at the port and in the night, those products get into the market. Go there, they load these products, uh, and then tracks. get onto the market. Who is monitoring this? Yeah. I mean, besides compromising on product quality, it gives. A, I mean, it gives room for <laughs> some of these money launderers mm -hmm. to wash their money. So, 
the national security, the BNI, all the security agencies so need to take up. an interest in this, nip this in the bud, and, and, and prevent any situation from mm, occurring. Rather than overburdening the guy who wants to do the I think, right thing. I think that the, we, the, the taxpayer today, or uh, taxes on petroleum products is too high. We too, need to review high. it. We need to revise it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it gives avenue to all these miscreants to enrich themselves. Yeah. Anytime you increase prices, you increase the wealth of these people. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, you create more room, and you do. then they. Anyway, so as an energy quest, we have great interest in women in the sector. So, how well does a downstream employ women? Well, I w think. What are the uh, issues? Maybe just to take you back to um, engine uh, when when I was managing director. What I instituted was was what I call uh, uh, women in energy. Uh, okay. So I set up this. Uh, it was an initiative to to try and project the women in my company. Okay. Uh, to form some kind of uh, not an association, but anything that could that could promote or build their capacities yeah. to take on higher roles. Their presence uh, felt exactly. in, in the company. In the process, we engage with other uh, other women in the sector. I mean, I'm sure today when you look around, you can talk of uh, the MD of AI Energy, uh, of course yourself, <laughs> yeah. and then uh, many other women who have championed or uh, leading in the oil and gas sector. Okay. Uh, of course, for me, I believe that people should earn positions on merit. And I think there are many women who have proven themselves that, yeah, sure given the given chance, the they, they should be able to uh, deliver. You know, so there's that conscious effort on the part of Engine Ghana Limited, and of course, any other women advocacy group that seeks to promote the interest or uh, the professional development of women. Yeah. You know, we we have some kind of collaboration to promote it. Okay. Yeah. So finally, um, give us some advice on sustainable growth and development of the sector. Well, we, we have gotten to a point where the National Petroleum Authority needs to change the way they do things. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about the licensing regime. Today we have over 170 oil marketing companies. Question we need to ask is 170 oil marketing companies. <laughs> We have, we have more market. than 4,000 service stations or outlets in the country. Okay. Now look at our land space as Ghana. Compare that to Ivory Coast. In mm -hmm. Ivory Coast, they have just a, a little under 2,000 oil marketing companies or service stations. So, oh. Sorry. So we have more than we need. Mm -hmm. And we are we, still... And we are still giving licenses. We are still giving construction permits for people to... We have, gotten to, we have come to the, to the point where we need to prune it down. Now, pruning it down doesn't mean collapsing people's businesses, but we need to look at the minimum entry requirements to see if these 170 companies meet that threshold. If they don't meet it, let's begin to cut them out. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see the National Petroleum Authority getting to the point where before your license is renewed, you need to present your business plan to maybe a panel, mm -hmm. present your results for the previous year, convince them that you need to be in the sector before they renew your license to you. No, but that, that would make business continuity tough. It won't be difficult. tough. I mean, they just have to, to, to time it. I mean, if in the last quarter of the year they decide to engage or start this, this, uh, this activity, I'm sure before the end of the year, they will know which OMCs qualify mm -hmm. for their license to be renewed and those that need to go and maybe put their house in order before coming back in. Maybe some measures or that, that needs to that happen because if you look at the trend, the numbers that we have been studying, the the stock turnaround mm -hmm. for most outlets is going up. The number of days is going up. What this means is that if you send, let's say, 27,000 liters to a particular service station, yeah. it takes longer days for them to sell. to sell it than before. Now, if you are not able to sell before 21 days, it means that they are going to default on the GRA yeah, payment. Yeah, automatically. So do we, do we want to continue to I mean, sit with this situation or something has to be done about it? And for me, uh, I think we have too many service stations that we need. Yeah. 
looking at our size as a country, the vehicle population, all the industrial uh, concerns in the industry, in the country, we need to, as it were, prune it down. I mean, mm -hmm. some mergers and acquisitions yeah. need to happen. Um, today we have about 48 oil marketing companies okay. that are not working. The reason is either they have defaulted on taxes or there are all sorts of regulatory... Um, that they may have defaulted on and, and all that. held back. And such companies need to be rescued. Mm -hmm. they, need to be, um, they need to be taken over. Okay. Which leads me to this question or issue of local content. Good. The local content policy is looking at 100% Ghanaian companies taking over the industry in the foreseeable future. But question I ask myself is, okay, we are, there are some companies who are already in dire straits. Why are we not asking indigenous companies to take over take these companies? Over. Mm -hmm. But rather, we just want to see the exit of multinationals. What purpose is that going to serve us? Well, we, I think that this local content policy needs to be looked at. I mean, certain, um, some sections of the policy is, rest, is restricting <coughs> the existing OMCs to the market. Mm -hmm. So if the policy becomes law today, for example, Vivo Energy, Engine, Total, and Puma Energy will not be able to expand their retail network. Okay. Because the law will, will restrict them will from restrict doing so. Is that, is, that, is that what we want? But, you know, we, we don't actually have active antitrust laws mm -hmm. that help control competition. Mm -hmm. But these local content laws could help the smaller ones also come up because they are already too big. And no, so you, competing I, with them is I don't not very think so. easy. I mean, so if you look at the market share statistics today, about more than 70% of the market is controlled by indigenous companies. More Compa than 70%? More than 70%. Compare this to five years ago, where 40% of the market was controlled by just three companies, Gold, mm -hmm. Shell, Total. Okay. Today, that is, not, that is not the case. Not the case. I mean, Vivo has less than 10% market share, same as wow. Total. Puma and then Engine. So if you mm -hmm. put all the market, if you put the market share together, it's less than it's probably around twenty-seven percent or yeah. so. This did not happen because there was a local because content of local law. Content. But the market evolved. There have been more forces. players mm -hmm. and all that. So you don't have to see. And again, these multinationals also have local shareholders. That's Engine true. Ghana, for example, has fifty-five percent of their shares being and held by, by a Ghanaian, Ghanaian entity. Company. Total is listed on the Ghana Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. Vivo Energy has more than 10% shares being held by a Ghanaian. Puma Energy has about 40% shares being held by a Ghanaian. So if you are restricting the market to these companies, it's your own people. They means your own people you're that you're restricting the market to. Mm -hmm. You know, so we need to look at it and say, well, maybe uh, we made a mistake in the past, but going forward, any new entrant that wants to come in here must conform to these set of guidelines. Otherwise, uh, we may be sending the, the wrong signal to the investing community internationally that when you invest in Ghana, a number of years down the line, you'll be asked yeah, to leave. That's true. That's true. That's, that's why I personally have more interest in looking at anti competition laws more than pushing the foreign companies. Yeah, but out. Uh, again, I mean, if, if it is a matter of empowering these uh, indigenous companies, let's look at the mining sector today. But the Minerals Commission Act, yeah. multinational companies that are not hundred percent owned cannot supply fuel to the mining companies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so question: How many indigenous companies are supplying fuel to the mining companies yeah, today? Have the capacity. There are just three of them. So how do you even ensure that there's fair and equitable distribution across? Across everybody benefits. How are you going to ensure that? So we need to think through this and not rush into. Any, any decision to see the exit of these uh, multinational companies? Yeah, because they do employ lots of Ghanaians. I mean, mo, 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 they, they, they do they employ... They do contribute to their quota. They, they employ, they build the capacity. The I mean, a number of indigenous oil marketing companies have come from or come out of these multinational yeah. companies. Yeah. And all the best practices that they are deploying now... Are from there. Are from there. Yeah. So do you want to see these companies? Again, if, if you look at the rate at which all marketing companies default on tax payment. You cannot cite a single multinational that has done so. Yeah. So if overnight you want to transfer the volume being controlled by 
the multinational companies to these indigenous companies, your guess, your guess is as good as mine. Wow. I believe in empowerment, I believe in indigenization, but I'm saying that let's ensure that we have built the capacities of these people and that they are in the position to protect the interests of the government and the country at large. Henry, thanks so much for your time. It's been so, so insightful. We are grateful. We hope to have you on the show again. And next time, I'll join you on the court. So Certainly. You're together. always welcome. I'll, I'll give you a, a racket if you want one. Thank uh, you. But any time you want to play, just, just give me a call. Okay. Thank you for having me. Thank you, too. This is what we do on Energy Quest. We demystify the energy sector and add value. Till we meet again. Ciao.